Ah, uh, so up next is John. John's going to be talking about Pico 8, which is quite an amazing little project, really. So I'll let him take it away. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my lovely town. I'm pleased to see you all here. Um, I'm John Dalton. I'm a Linux sysadmin and database analyst. Um, I'm not here to talk about anything that I actually know. I'm here to talk about uh, Pico 8. Um, I've discovered this. I love it. I want to share the love. Um, as a bit of a disclaimer, um, here's a short list of things that I'm not an expert on. These are all things I'm talking about. Um, Pico 8, I'm not any kind of expert on this, right? Uh, it's a cool little thing I found with an even cooler community, um, and I just want to share it with you. Um, I've written code throughout my career, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes much less frequently than that. Um, I don't consider myself to be any kind of expert on programming. Um, I've got no experience in the games industry. I'm not a games developer or any kind of expert on that. And I've spent um, a bit of time teaching kids uh, programming, programming concepts. Um, I love doing that. I'd like to do more of it, but I am no kind of expert on education. So it's mostly due to teaching kids that uh, I've ended up here today. Uh, that's because the way in which people learn to code has changed a lot over time, I think. Um, I'm going to take you briefly on a journey back in time to the first computers, um, not actually quite this far back. But back sort of 30 years ago to um, 1987, this is the first computer. It's not the actual computer, um, but it's somebody's copy of the first computer I ever did any programming on uh, in BASIC. That's an Amstrad CPC 6128. Um, and at the time, home computers were all generally pretty similar um, and also very incompatible. Um, some other machines I was exposed to around the same era was the venerable Commodore 64, not quite the Commodore 16. Who was that earlier? <laughs> um, BBC Micros. We had these in schools everywhere in Australia. Um, this pretty much looks like my high school, which dates me. Um, we had labs full of BBC Micros. And there were features that all of these machines had in common, which are much less common today. Uh, computers were ready within seconds of you turning them on. Uh, there's a programming environment built in. They often came with manuals that included programming language references. Uh, the manual that came with our Amstrad included a programming tutorial, um, building, building a, I think it was a phone book uh, database. Um, and they had multiple program listings as well. Uh, and I was a geek from a very early age. Um, we got this computer during the summer holidays after my parents saved up for it for a year. Um, and it might surprise some of you who've traveled south for this conference, which I think is just about everyone who isn't from Dunedin. Um, but even down here, you know, the stereotype of geeks hiding inside from the sun, and, you know, has some truth to it. I spent pretty much that entire summer holidays inside reading the manual, um, going through the tutorial, typing in listings. We didn't have the internet then. Um, it did exist. I'm not that old. Uh, but I didn't see it for another seven years. So if you want to learn about something, you went to the library. Um, and once all the games listings in our manual, you know, it kind of exhausted that as a resource. So I ransacked the shelves at the library for books about computer games. And this is the, the sort of thing I found. Um, these are from my personal collection. Uh, <laughs> so it turned out that none of the books had my computer in mind, right? Growing up, I only ever knew two people who had the same model computer as me. Um, and that didn't matter because all these books are written at a time when the expectation was that your computer might be different. So they give you tips on um, how to adjust things for slightly different dialects of basic. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, my fascination with computers and my desperation to get my hands on more games resulted in me learning skills that have given me a career uh, as a sysadmin, as a database analyst. I know that I've been incredibly fortunate um, that things turned out that way. You know, my parents sacrificed a lot to get that first machine. I'll take a moment to say, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Sorry about all the late nights. I was actually tapping away on the computer in there. Um, <laughs> if, look, if you want to capture the feeling of what it was like to learn to code in the 80s, you can fire up an emulator for any one of those sort of machines. Um, or you could take a look at Pico 8. Um, Pico 8 is a fantasy console. 
It's an 8-bit console that never existed. Um, it's half nostalgic trip, half artistic statement. It's a combined emulator and development environment for an imaginary system that might have existed about 30 years ago, designed to run on modern hardware. Uh, and I want to get one thing out of the way right up front, and that's to say that Pico 8 is not open source. Uh, it's proprietary software. You can buy it. It's about $20 Australian. You can get it for Windows, Mac, and Linux. There's a build to run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, the license terms are generous for educational use, not just for schools. Uh, and if you take this and use it to teach people, you can give students a take-home license at like an 80% discount or something. So people can and do use it, however, to create games under open source licenses. Uh, there are a number of open source tools built by the community, which I'm going to talk about shortly. So what does this imaginary console look like? Uh, it's a really restricted sort of environment. Um, it has a 128 by 128 pixel display with a fixed palette of 16 colors. Uh, for comparison, that Amstrad that was my first computer had a 160 by 200 pixel 16 color display. Um, and this Pebble watch on my wrist has a 144 by 168 pixel display that can do 64 colors. So by modern standards, the Pico 8 screen resolution is really tiny. Um, it has four channel audio capable of producing what the author describes as chip <coughs> blurps, which was standard for the time. Um, it's meant to be emulating a console rather than a home computer. So when you're not using one of the editor modes, your input is the equivalent of a controller uh, with a D-pad and two buttons, although it does support multiple controllers. Um, it has a maximum cartridge size of 32 kilobytes. Uh, the program code, sprites, map data, sound effects, music, all of that has to fit within that 32K. And um, a key thing to note is that Pico 8 isn't just an emulator for this fantasy console, right? It's also the complete development environment. Um, and here is what that looks like. <laughs> Sorry, Pico 8 code is written in a subset of Lua that doesn't include any access to the standard library. Um, it has an, a simple API that provides access to all the Pico 8 specific functionality. Uh, games that are created in Pico 8 are distributed in a single file called a cartridge. Um, it's either a plain text source file, which contains both the code and the data, which looks like this. Um, or alternatively, it's a PNG image of the imaginary cartridge that the imaginary hardware might have used. <laughs> um, and the thing about 32K size restriction is that you can actually fit all of that data hidden inside an image and nobody's going to notice a few extra kilobytes <laughs> coming along with it there. So the, uh, the actual image of the cartridge is the cartridge data as well as the picture that represents the imaginary cartridge. Um, both of those formats require Pico 8 to actually run the games. Um, however, there's an HTML and JavaScript export that produces a standalone version that will run inside a web browser. Uh, the Pico 8 license explicitly permits modifying and redistributing the exported JavaScript runtime environment. This is from the license. Um, JavaScript and HTML files generated by exporting a cartridge with Pico 8 may be used for any purpose, including commercial applications, and to alter them and redistribute them freely, provided that permission to do so is also granted by the authors of the cartridge. Um, the built-in tools for editing sprites, maps, sound, music, they're all pretty basic but very usable. Uh, but if you're anything like me, you're going to find that code editor to be claustrophobic pretty quickly. Right? Even on my Amstrad, I didn't actually edit code in a resolution that low. It had a two-color, 80-column screen resolution that was better for actually editing text. So probably the first thing you're going to want to do is use an external editor. Um, I use Vim. The community's produced syntax highlighters for, um, for Vim, for Atom, for various other sort of editors that you might want to use, um, even though it's Lua because it's a specific dialect and has some slight syntax differences that they support as well. Um, 
it's just plain text. So you can keep it in a Git repository or whatever. And where it starts to get tricky is if you want to um, collaborate with other people. If you have someone working on art using a built-in sprite editor and somebody else working on music and you're working on code and you want to integrate all of those changes, uh, it can get fiddly very, very quickly. Um, it would be far easier if you could let people work on their own stuff locally and then merge in their changes without everyone having to become Git wizards, <laughs> without having to explain to um, you know, your artist friends how to actually commit just their changes. And <laughs> so uh, there are tools that the community has developed to help with that kind of thing. Pico8 supports copying and pasting between carts, which is a little bit clumsy. Uh, there's this tool called Pico Tool written in Python by Dan Sanderson. It's released under an MIT license, which can selectively merge sections of different carts together to produce a single output cartridge. Uh, there are also open source tools for extracting the sprite sheets, so you can edit them in a dedicated sprite editor um, and then merge that back into a cartridge. Um, people have developed, uh, this is an alternative development environment. Um, it's called P8 Coder released on GPL v3, written in mono. He's only tested on Windows, but it's written in mono. So, um, And that's designed specifically for editing Pico 8 cartridges, um, has some other stuff built in. Um, and aside from development tools, people have been working on alternative ways to distribute cartridges. Uh, I mentioned that Pico 8 can export carts as HTML uh, and JavaScript. Uh, the exporter form can be freely modified and distributed. The JavaScript that's produced in that export is 1.2 megabytes of ASM.js. Right. So it's um, not exactly friendly to modify. Um, so this is an alternative experimental JavaScript runtime, which is still very much in early stages. Um, has some missing functionality, which shows some really promising demos. They've, they've managed to... Um, to do some interesting stuff and you, you can see a kind of cool cathode ray tube effect there which is optional <laughs> in the display. Um, that's on GitHub under an MIT license, that address. Um, there's Pico Love, which is an implementation of the Pico 8 API um, for Love, which is an open source framework for building 2D games um, that run on desktop and mobile applications, right, so, um, or in platforms. Love already uses Lua, so PicoLove provides a kind of a migration path for people who um, might have built or prototyped something on Pico8. Uh, they want to be able to grow beyond the restrictive environment or they might want to deploy it on a platform that's not supported. Uh, this is released under the Zlib license. Um, at this point, I can imagine some of you might be thinking, hang on, these are all tools for people who are willing to use proprietary software. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hate freedom, John? <laughs> right. So if, if that sounds like you, um, you might be interested in this. Uh, Leetcode 12 calls itself a clone of Pico 8. Um, it has different API and it's got a bigger screen width. It's obviously very, very heavily inspired by Pico 8. Um, it's also built on top of Love and available on GitHub under GPL v3. Um, it's still early days and it's an ambitious project. Um, but it really gets at the heart of what appeals to me uh, so much about Pico 8 um, in that it is this whole integrated environment. Uh, and as you see, as you can see there, they've, they've reproduced quite a bit of it. You know, they've got the editors integrated, all that kind of thing. So why does any of this matter? Uh, what's the appeal of an environment like this? Are we all just stuck in the 80s? Sad old people longing for the glory days. <laughs> um, you know, maybe. That's, <laughs> that's quite possibly true. Um, a lot of the nostalgia comes about because we remember a simpler time. And computers really are, I think, orders of magnitude more complex now. Um, and it's easy to look at kids with modern devices like tablets and smartphones, games, consoles, and think of them solely as consumers of other people's content. Um, and I want to go back to a time when every computer was a device that could be used to create rather than just to consume. Um, but it's not true that kids aren't creating. You know, creativity is a natural human instinct. They will create things no matter what obstacles we put in their way. They create, they share, they teach each other. The games that they're playing these days show that the world is kind of slowly bending toward their will in that respect. Success of games like Minecraft or Roblox 
um, games centered around building, exploring, creating, they show that um, kids embrace environments that let them express their creativity and share it with others. But the spaces that they inhabit are often proprietary. They don't really own their creations if someone else ultimately has the power to turn it off and take it away from them. We've seen it happen before. Um, does anybody have a GeoCities page? You know, <laughs> um, you know. I mean, can you imagine a future in which Minecraft just stopped working, right? In chaos. <laughs> Um, <laughs> right, but, uh, but we actually have open source Minecraft servers now, you know, we've, people are becoming aware of that, companies are becoming tolerant of uh, this kind of stuff uh, to, to varying extents depending on the companies and who bought the companies. Um, but, uh, you know, in my experiences as well with teaching kids about programming, um, you know, the sharing and the helping each other, they're all natural instincts. They don't hesitate to build on top of what somebody else has built. They don't hold back when other people need help figuring out problems. But the environments that we use to teach them about programming often bear little resemblance to the real world. Um, Josh and I, and I particularly love this, have come at this from exactly opposite perspectives. <laughs> Josh wants to create a world where we get to drag the pretty things around, and I want to teach people about the real world where we deal with text. And <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's great, right? Because there isn't one approach that's going to work for everybody. Um, these have, you know, these sorts of things at the bottom one, there's code.org slash learn. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you should try out. The top one is Scratch, of course, which um, runs on Flash and it's horrible to run anywhere. Um, but, you know, it's an incredible tool for teaching people. And they, they have um, really low barrier to entry, but moving to a text-based environment can be a huge jump. I've spent afternoons teaching 10-year-olds how to do HTML and CSS. And the number of things that you need to either cover or ignore and kind of hand wave away, just to do something as simple as that, is really depressing how complicated this stuff has become. And just getting them comfortable with programming in a text-based environment um, is a challenge. But so an environment that restricts the scope to something more manageable really appeals to me. Uh, there are other tools that teach text-based programming in constrained environments. They often rely on accesses, uh, access to resources that not all students are going to have. Um, Pico 8 will run on a Raspberry Pi, and with the educational discount, it becomes feasible to consider things like just giving every student in a lab one to take home with an environment on it that they can develop with. And if these open source projects that are inspired by the approach, such as Lico 12, um, if they take off, then every kid can have something like this by default. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is the importance of community. Uh, the Pico 8 community isn't always explicit about their licensing. You know, the, the tools are generally open source. Most of the games don't actually mention a license. But despite that, the community has sharing kind of as a core concept to everything that they do. And on the forums, you see behavior that looks a lot like an open source approach. This is a developer of a popular platform game um, explaining to somebody who's asked about looking at the code was, okay, well, here's how you get the code. And if you have trouble with that, I'll actually upload just the raw source code for you. Um, and in that same thread, somebody else has gone and forked it. They finished it. They said, you know what? I'm going to make a harder version. Here it is for everyone else. <laughs> I've taken your game and posted it right under the developer's nose <laughs> with, um, with my own version. And that's fine. You know, later in the thread, um, Pico 8 has released an update, and the update's broken part of the way that the sequencer works, and so the music stops working in this popular game. And somebody says, you know what, I can fix that. Um, here it is. I've posted the updated version that now works again, and the, uh, the author replies and says, that's excellent, and posts that as the new official update of the game. So, you know, that's, that's basically the same as accepting a pull request and merging it from someone. So the community, even if they're not perhaps using the right terminology, they're not necessarily you're being explicit about their licenses, they've certainly got the core of what it means to be sharing things. Um, they've written zines, uh, this excellent zine with multiple issues. They do really cool things like um, post carts that fit in a tweet, right? And then follow it up with a GIF of, uh, well, here's what the output looks like. Um, that one's pretty cool. <laughs> And um, the guy's explaining, I don't know if you can read his comment there. He says, I'm glad Pico 8 seeds the first sprite with a little icon or this cellular automata wouldn't fit the 140 limit. <laughs> 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 so, 
So, um, <coughs> you know, basic intellectual property concepts aren't things that kids understand instinctively. Um, the, thought that <laughs> the thought that people can own ideas, you know, or that people can give you an idea and then tell you how you're allowed to use it. So in most cases, I care less about them understanding differences between different licenses and more about them keeping hold of that impulse to share, uh, to default to openness. And that's why I think that it's especially important to foster and encourage communities that have sharing at their heart, because um, when people already understand the value of sharing, it's easy to start those conversations about open source licensing. Um, it's easy to explain to people how licenses can be used to stop people taking away the ability for you to share. That's me done sharing the love. Um, I hope you're inspired to check out this cool project, uh, maybe even contribute some of the open source tools or alternatives. And I hope that this uh, encourages you to think about the design decisions that we make in building things uh, that can impact the kind of community that grows around something that we build and put out into the world, you know, to encourage sharing behaviours or to encourage other positive behaviours that we want to build and, and have people default to being open. I don't know that I have time for questions. Um, excellent. There's a link there um, to some, it's sort of a curated list of some great resources. Um, that's me on Twitter. Questions? Um, so, uh, Richard, can you come up and set up while we'll get uh, some yep. questions for John? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you know, but uh, are many of the people that play with Pico 8 programmers? Yeah, a lot. Uh, so it's, it's um, popular, I think, because, because it's such a small environment. It's a thing you can sort of do for fun. Um, there's never the temptation to keep building something and never release it. Eventually, you're going to run out of space, right, in 32K. <laughs> so people build some really small stuff. Um, People build the most incredible stuff. Uh, you know, I thought this would be an environment that's sort of more my pace and quickly found people doing things in 3D. And it's like, whoa, hang on, you're, you're doing maths here. This is proper maths. Yeah, there are a lot of programmers um, as well as people who are just coming to this for the first sort of time. So um, it's... No, no, it's all right. You yeah? keep, you, okay. you keep talking. <laughs> yes, so it's everyone, but definitely programmers as well. So just a quick question, um, you seem to, I've got a couple of reasonably young kids myself, they're the 9 and, and 11, Yep. Um, that, this is awesome, I, I'm going to take this home and show to my kids, do you have anything else you recommend for kids, because it seems like you have kids around that age as well, or you deal yeah, with kids Yeah, I've got um, an 11 year old, a 10 year old, and two 6, almost 7 year olds. Um, <clears throat> so code.org slash learn is the, where they have the hour of code stuff, um, I've spent, uh, Recently, just the end of last year, I spent a couple of days with classes at my local primary school. Uh, there's a huge variety of stuff there targeting different age groups and in bite-sized chunks. Um, when people want to move beyond some of those things, which are sort of a lot of them are more the scratch-oriented stuff, um, there's a website called Code Combat, which supports, uh, it, it's like building your, the AI for an RPG game. Um, it supports a bunch of different languages like Python and Lua and JavaScript and um, it's a really good, I think, introduction to some text-based programming in a constrained environment like I was talking about. So it's something anyone can run from a web browser. Um, Swift Playgrounds, if you're willing to do the iOS thing. Um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, all right, I think that's all we've got all time right. for, so please give a round of applause, John.